بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على خاتم الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وأصحابه والتابعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد Certainly our praises belong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for he is the creator, sustainer and controller of the universe and all within and we invoke his peace and blessings upon his noble messenger, his family, his companions, and all those who follow them in righteousness until the end of time. And may Allah be exalted cause us all to be among them. Respected brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How is everybody doing? You guys are excited? You're excited? Why? Because the iftar is there? Or Eid is there, it's only 10 days away now. Or the last 10 nights begin tonight, inshallah. So we have an opportunity to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the night that we all know as Laylatul Qadr, the night of power. But tonight, inshallah, this evening, I want to share with you some thoughts and ideas about our topic, Ramadan, the month of the Quran. Now, brothers and sisters, and I would like to take a moment to acknowledge our deaf brothers and sisters. You may notice them uh, using signs. They're deaf, so if they don't always do things the way we do, just cut them a little bit of slack. Uh, brothers and sisters, the revelation of the Quran, the revelation of the Quran is indeed the greatest miracle of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now the Prophet Alaihi Wasallam, yes, did perform other miracles in his lifetime. In fact, other Prophets as well, in their lifetimes, performed miracles. But the greatest miracle of all time is the revelation of the Qur'an. It's the Qur'an itself. It's this book itself. And the reason it is the greatest miracle, and I mean, the prophets of Allah in their lifetimes performed miracles that were absolutely astounding. You know, the parting of the sea by Musa alayhi salam is no simple feat. The making of a clay model of a bird by Lisa, by Jesus, peace be upon you. And then simply blowing on that clay model, and that clay model becomes a live bird. That is no simple feat. It's indeed great miracles. Yet the greatest miracle is the Quran itself. And the reason is, brothers and sisters, is that all the miracles that were performed were done for a specific incident or a specific challenge, and then it ended. It did not endure. The parting of the sea by Musa alayhi salam did not stay like that for a very long time. The sea goes back, right? So all these miracles, great miracles were performed, but they were a result of a specific incident or challenge at the time and then they ended. But the Quran is the enduring miracle. It is for all times. And it is a challenge for mankind throughout time until the day of judgment. So it does not end. The Quran does not end. Now we all know that Allah revealed the Quran in the night of power. And this night is so great, so virtuous, so meritorious, that Allah describes it in the Quran as better than a thousand months. Not just equal to brothers and sisters, it's better than. And a thousand months, if you do the math, would be about 83 years and four months. The average lifespan of a person in Canada today is 82 years. So what will take a person an entire lifetime of worship 
on the other days to accomplish and achieve, that person can achieve in this one night. That's how great the night is. So imagine, brothers and sisters, if the night is so great, imagine the greatness of the book that gave this night its virtues. So we tend to focus on the night, and we don't realize that really it is the Quran, brothers and sisters, that gave rise to Laylatul Qadr. It is the Quran that gave rise to the night of power. So no Quran, no Laylatul Qadr, no night of power. And if the night is so great, imagine the, the Quran that gave rise to the night, how powerful and great that is. So indeed, as Allah tells us, He revealed the Qur'an in Ramadan. Ramadan is the month of the Qur'an, brothers and sisters. It is the month in which the Prophet ﷺ used to revise the Qur'an with Jibreel. Every Ramadan. And Ramadan was made compulsory, or fasting in Ramadan was made compulsory on the Muslims in the second year after the migration. So for eight years, until the Prophet peace be upon him died, every Ramadan, Jibra'il would come to him every night, we are told in the Hadith, in Sahih al bukhari And he would revise with the Prophet peace be upon him whatever was revealed of the Qur'an. And in the last Ramadan before he passed away, so this would be Ramadan of the 10th year of the migration. Because the Prophet peace be upon him died in, at the beginning of the 11th year, in the third month, Rabir al awwal Ramadan is the ninth month. So about six months before he passed away, he witnessed the last Ramadan of his life. In this last Ramadan, Jibra'il re revised with him the Qur'an two times, not just one time. Because by this time, the majority, the vast majority of the Qur'an was revealed. But the really big question for us today, at this point in time, is what exactly is the reason and the purpose of the revelation of this Qur'an? Why did Allah send it now? As Muslims, we're all proud of the Qur'an, brothers and sisters, and we have every right to be proud. We are proud that Allah says, ذَٰلِكَ الْكِتَابُ لَا وَيْبَفِينَ In this book, there is no doubt. We are proud that Allah says, Do they not ponder the Qur'an and study it? If it had been from any source other than Allah, they would have found in it many contradictions. So we are proud, and rightly so, of the Qur'an as being Truly revelation from God Almighty, from Allah the Exalted. We even want the non-Muslims to read the Qur'an, brothers and sisters. When a non-Muslim comes to ask questions about Islam, one of the first things we do, we hand them a copy of a translation of the Qur'an. And we tell them, go read the Qur'an. Learn the message from its source. And then if you have questions, you can come back. So it's ironic that we want the non-Muslims to read the Qur'an and yet sadly many of us Muslims have never read the whole Qur'an. How many of us who don't know Arabic language have read a translation of the entire Qur'an from the beginning to the end. From the first chapter, Al-Fatiha, right down to the last chapter. Surah and Nas. Now normally we read from the beginning, right? Surah Al-Baqarah, the first, second chapter. And then we may read a few chapters in the middle, Yasin, Ar-Rahman. And then we go to the end. But there are chapters in the middle, brothers and sisters, that many of us Muslims have never opened the Mus'haf to those pages. So what exactly is the purpose of the revelation of the Qur'an? What kind of relationship 
and connection do we have with the Quran and should we have with the Quran? Is it is this relationship based on the fact that we recite it in the month of Ramadan? That we want to listen to its recitation in the night prayers in Ramadan, the Talabi prayers? And then when Ramadan ends, the book goes back on the shelves and we don't pick it up again till next Ramadan? Is that the relationship we have with the Quran, brothers and sisters? This end enduring miracle of the Prophet that the scholars tell us is the greatest miracle of all times. Is that the kind of relationship we have with the Quran, with the Book of Allah? Is the relationship one in which we only recite it on special occasions? When somebody dies, we gather in the masjid, we recite the Quran. You know, brothers and sisters, we love to recite Surah Yasin when somebody passes away. Do you know what Allah tells us in Surah Yasin? The same Surah we like to read for those who die. Allah says, وَمَا عَلَّمْنَاهُ الشِّعْرِ We did not teach him poetry. This Quran is not poetry. وَمَا يَنْبَلِي لَهُ It is not fitting for him either to learn poetry. إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا ذِكْرٌ وَقُرْآنٌ مُبِينٌ Allah says, it is nothing more but a reminder and a clear Qur'an, meaning a Qur'an that makes things clear. What is the purpose? Allah says, لِيُنْفِرَ مَنْ كَانَ حَيَّ To warn those who are alive, not the dead brothers and sisters. This Qur'an is not for the dead, it's for the living. And if one cannot benefit from the Qur'an while he or she is alive, then you cannot benefit from it after you die. So what is this relationship and connection we have with the Qur'an? Is it to be recited on this special occasion of someone passing away? Or upon their death anniversary every year? Or somebody has a birthday or a wedding anniversary? Or they pass an exam? Or they get a promotion? Is this the kind of relationship we have with the Qur'an where it's regulated to these uh, few and far between events every year and after that we're on our own. Brothers and sisters, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala informed us of the purpose of the revelation of the Quran. He informed us as to the reason why he sent down this Quran. And so in the verse, the well-known verse in Surah Al-Baqarah, the verse that we all like to quote to prove that Ramadan is the month of the Qur'an. In that same verse, Allah tells us why He revealed the Qur'an. The problem is we just stop at the beginning of the verse. We don't continue. So here's what Allah says. شَهْرُ رَمَضَانَ الَّذِي أُنْزِلَ فِيهِ الْقُرْآنِ The month of Ramadan is the month in which the Qur'an was revealed. But the ayah doesn't end there, brothers and sisters. Immediately Allah says, Hudan linnas, as guidance for mankind. As guidance for mankind. Wa bayinatin bin al and clear evidence of the guidance. So it's guidance for mankind, and it has evidence that it is guidance for mankind. Wal Furqan and the criteria. That which shows us the way distinguishes between right and wrong, truth and falsehood. So guidance for mankind, as Allah tells us, brothers and sisters, you know this, He didn't tell us, we reveal the Quran so you can recite it for a tawar, although that is important. We'll talk about that just now, inshallah. But He says guidance for mankind. And a guide is someone who shows us the way a guide is one who shows you the way. The guide is the one who tells you what is right and what is not right. The guide is the one who tells you which way to go. If you were to visit a foreign country on a tour, they'll probably provide you with a guide. 
and you are expected to listen to and follow the instructions of the guide. So the guide is the one who is supposed to tell us what to do and what not to do. What good is a guide, brothers and sisters? If we don't know what the guide is saying, we cannot understand the guide. What good is a guide if we have no clue what the guide is saying? He may say a lot of good things. You may visit a country with a lot of history, and there is a lot to learn. But if you cannot understand your guide, or if you don't pay attention to the guide, and follow his instructions, you will not benefit much from that journey and from the history. So what good is it to us to have a guide but we have no clue what the guide is telling us? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in another verse tells us again, He explains the purpose of this Quran. Not just to be proud. Hey, this is revelation from God and you can't find any mistakes in it. It is that. That's not why Allah revealed it. Allah says, Kitabun anzalnahu wa ilayka mubarakun. This is a blessed book which we have revealed to you, O Muhammad. Why? In order that they may reflect upon its verses. And you know what's interesting, brothers and sisters? Throughout the Quran, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about learning and studying Qur'an. He never talks about literally reading Qur'an. Qiraatul Qur'an. He doesn't talk about that. But he talks about tadabur. He talks about pondering, studying, analyzing, questioning. So Allah says, this is a blessed book which we have revealed to you so that they, the people, you and I, may reflect upon its signs. May think about its verses. And that those of understanding, the people of understanding, will be reminded. Reminded of what? Reminded of the message. In yet another verse, Allah the Exalted tells us, وَكَذَلِكَ أَنزَلْنَاهُ قُرْآنًا عَرَبِيًّا وَصَرَّفْنَا فِيهِ مِنَ الْآيَاتِ وَصَرَّفْنَا فِيهِ مِنَ الْوَعِيدِ لَعَلَّهُمْ يَتَّقُونَ أَوْ يُحْدِثَ أَوْ يُحْدِثُ لَهُمْ ذِكْرًا And thus we have sent it down as an Arabic Qur'an and have diversified therein the warnings that perhaps they will avoid sin. Right? The Qur'an is supposed to tell us what to do and what not to do. That's what guide means. That perhaps they will avoid sin or that it will cause them to be reminded of the message. In yet another verse, Allah the Exalted tells us, Alif Lam Ra, Kitabun anzalnahu ilayka li tukhrija al-nasa min al-ulumat ila al-nuri bi-ithni rabbihim ila sirat al-aziz al-hameed. Allah says, this is a book which we reveal to you that you may bring mankind, mankind out of darkness into light. That's the purpose of this Qur'an. To take us out of darkness into light. Without the Qur'an, the Prophet peace be upon him could not do this on his own. You know, before he received revelation, he used to meditate in the cave of Hira. But he used to sit in the cave and he used to think. He used to wonder. He understood that the trends of his society were wrong. He understood and he knew that society was headed in the wrong direction. But the Prophet, peace be upon him, he had no clue. How does he change this? How does he change this trend in society, this direction? It was the revelation that gave him the blueprint for this change, brothers and sisters. So the purpose of the Quran is transformation, changing people, and as a result, society. So Allah says, and we have revealed to you this book so that you may take people out of darkness into light 
by the commission of their Lord to the path of the exalted in mind of praise worthy. So these are but a few verses, brothers and sisters, out of many in which Allah highlights the purpose of the revelation of the Quran. It is guidance. It is supposed to tell us what to do and what not to do. It is supposed to tell us how to live. It is supposed to tell us where to go and where not to go. It is supposed to tell us how to speak and how not to speak. It is supposed to tell us what to wear and what not to wear, how to dress. Now just in case, brothers and sisters, one believes it's not a big deal, you know, I'll take my chances, I'll just live life however I feel like. There are serious consequences to being heedless and mindless of the message of the Qur'an. Allah the Exalted tells us about the consequence. Allah says, فَإِمَّا يَأْتِيَنَّكُمْ مِنِّي هُدَى فَمَنْ تَبِعَ هُدَايَ فَلَا يَضِلُّ وَلَا يَشْقَى And if there should come to you guidance from me, notice Allah says guidance. And you know what guide is, right? We talked about that. And if there should come to you guidance from me, then whoever follows my guidance, whoever follows my guidance, not do whatever they feel like doing, not living life based on their whims and their fancies and their desires, but follows my guidance. Allah says, such a person will never go astray in this world, nor will they suffer in the hereafter. And isn't this what we are all aspiring for in life, brothers and sisters? To live a good life, to be guided in this world, and not to have to suffer in the hereafter? Well, the path to that is not becoming a millionaire. Although if Allah's blessed you, that's good. The path to that is to follow the guidance of Allah. Follow your guide, listen to the guide. Follow His instructions. Tayyip, Allah also tells us about the person who does not follow his guidance, his guidance. Whoever follows my guidance, Allah says, that he will never be go astray in this world and will never suffer in the hereafter. Allah says, and whoever turns away from my guidance or my remembrance. Indeed, he will have a distressed life. Hayatan dunka. The word dunk means to feel squeezed and pressured. We call it stress, anxiety, depression, and a whole bunch of other names. Allah says, whoever turns away from my guidance, from my remembrance, then that's the kind of life that person will experience. A life of stress and anxiety and, and depression, a depressed life, a life in which we feel squeezed and constricted. As if the whole world is narrow. You can't, you can hardly breathe. And on top of that, Allah says, And we shall resurrect him on the day of judgment blind, can't see. In our world today, brothers and sisters, we have a lot of people with all kinds of mental issues. And perhaps it is because we have, we have turned our backs on the guidance of Allah the Exalted. We try to achieve happiness in life on our own without following our guide. And instead of finding happiness, what we find is more stress. Stress upon stress upon stress. The judgment will say, Qala Rabbi, lima hashabtani a'ma, wa kuntu basira. The person will say, my Lord, why did you resurrect me blind when I could see in this world? I was not blind. And Allah the Exalted will say to him, Qala kadhalika atatka ayati, fa nasitaha, fa kadhalika al-yawma tunsa, wa kadhalika al-yawma tunsa. And Allah will say to him, he will say, thus did our signs come to you, but you forgot them. 
It was as if you were blinded, you couldn't see them. And so today, you also, you will be forgotten. So brothers and sisters, the question is, what should we do? And I want to leave with you three pieces of advice regarding the Quran. What is it we ought to do in order to truly honor the Quran as the greatest miracle of all times, which was revealed as guidance for us? The first thing we all ought to do, brothers and sisters, each one of us, male and female, young and old, young and old, all of us should make it our lifelong endeavor, our lifelong struggle, brothers and sisters, to learn to recite the Quran as it was revealed, as it was revealed, with proper pronunciation of its letters, and with the proper tajweed. For tajweed is not something that was developed by the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Prophet simply listened to Jibra'il, the angel, reciting to him the words of Allah. And he simply imitated that. And Jibra'il himself, alayhi salam, this noble angel, when Allah wanted to reveal any verse or verses of the Quran, and he called his angel Jibra'il, Allah recited to him the Quran that he wanted to reveal. And Jibra'il listened. On the way down from Allah to the Prophet, he did not make up the dream, no. He recited to the Prophet, peace be upon him, exactly as your Allah recited the Quran to him. My point is, brothers and sisters, we don't seem to get this, but my point is, reciting the Quran with proper pronunciation and with proper rules of tajweed, it's not a choice. If we feel like we can do it and if we don't, it's okay. No, it's not okay. It is part of the revelation itself. SubhanAllah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran. And those who disbelieve say, why was the Quran revealed to him all at once? Instead of bits and pieces, the whole Quran one time. Allah says, كَذَلِكَ لِيُثَبِّدَ بِهِ فُوَاتًا Thus it is, that is, we reveal it in bits and pieces, why? So that we may strengthen thereby your heart, we may comfort your heart. وَرَدَّلْنَاهُ تَرْتِيلًا and we have spaced it distinctly. Now this translation, we have spaced it distinctly, really doesn't do justice to this expression, The verb ratala in Arabic means to sing, to chant, to recite in a sing song. That's what it means. So the, the Quran is not something we talk. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. No, you have to recite it in a rhythmic voice and tone. This is what Tardil means. And in another chapter, Allah tells us, He speaks to the Prophet, peace be upon him, Ya Ayyuh al Muzammil, O you who is wrapped up, Qum il layla illa qalila. Allah says, Get up and pray in the night time, except for a little bit of the night. Nisfahu awit minhu qalila. Half of it, or subtract from it a little. Or add to it, increase it a little bit. Half the night, two thirds, one third, three quarters, right? Again, Allah talks about tartil. And recite the Quran with measured recitation. This is the translation. But what it is, is to recite it in a rhythmic voice and tone based on how it was revealed. In a hadith in Sahih Muslim, the Prophet peace be upon him tells us, Allah does not listen to anything as he listens to a Prophet reciting the Quran in a sweet voice loudly, not just silently, but loudly. 
in another hadith in Sahih Muslim, the Prophet peace be upon him tells us, the one who is proficient in reciting the Quran is associated with the noble and upright recording angels. He is associated with the angels. And the one who falters in it and finds difficulty in reciting the Quran will have a double reward. So I know brothers and sisters, right? Our older brothers and sisters might say, look, you know, I'm a senior citizen now. I can't learn to read this Quran properly. Well, this hadith, brothers and sisters, this is your inspiration and motivation. That if you find difficulty, that's not a cue to give up, no. That is the cue to keep on going. For that person gets a double reward, as the Prophet ﷺ promised. The one who falters in it and finds difficulty in reciting. I know if you're 60 and 70 years old, it's not easy to, to train your tongue to pronounce certain letters and certain combinations of letters. That's a, that's a tough uh, combination of letters. But for us as Muslims, brothers and sisters, it is our obligation, our duty, our wajib to spend our life, our whole life if we have to. Where are we going? We're not going anywhere. We're right here. Up until death comes knocking on our door, spend this life in learning to recite the Quran, the Book of Allah, properly. It is ironic that we're proud of the Qur'an and we can't recite it properly. If we're so proud of the Qur'an, then the first thing on the list is that we should all also be proud to be able to recite it properly. So after Ramadan ends, brothers and sisters, call up the IIT, contact Brother Farhan here. Tell him you want classes to learn to read Qur'an. MashaAllah, we have people amongst us who can help us. They have the skills and the expertise. So that's the first thing. That each one of us make it a lifelong endeavor. We don't need to do this in a week or two, brothers and sisters. Yes. But let us do this, make it our lifelong goal and endeavor to learn to recite the Quran, even if it takes us years. The effort is what is, is really key and important. The second thing I want all of us to do, brothers and sisters, is to, if you don't know Arabic language, is to read a translation of the Qur'an from the beginning to the end. Not just a few verses here and there. From the beginning, from Surah Al-Fatiha, the first chapter, right down to the last chapter. You do not have to do this in one month. You don't have to do it in two months, or in six months. Take a whole year, or more than a year. How long have we been alive, brothers and sisters? How many times have we read the, the translation of the Qur'an? Once? Not even once perhaps? I don't know. All these years. You see, if we don't read it, brothers and sisters, a translation so we can understand. And again, that's key, right? Because we need to understand the guide. How will we know what Allah has given to us? How will we know what this guide is telling us? Which way the guy is telling us to go? How will we? We can't. Now when I talk about reading the Quran or a translation, I am not talking about a casual reading. Where you simply read the translation of one verse and you go to the next verse and the next verse and the next verse till you complete it. No. The reading has to be done with some thinking and pondering and reflection. As Allah tells us, and I mentioned this verse earlier, this is a blessed book which we have revealed to you, that they may reflect upon its verses. Reflect, brothers and sisters. So when you read, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, praise be to Allah, Lord of the universe. Don't go to the next verse until you, you think about what is this universe that Allah talks about. Learn a little bit about the universe. Then you will understand the infinite and creative powers of Allah the Creator. Then we will understand why we ought to praise Allah the Exalted. 
And then we go to the next verse, the beneficent, the merciful, or the compassionate, the merciful. Of all the names and attributes, Allah tells us in many verses of the Quran, He is severe in punishment. My punishment, that is the most severe punishment. And yet here, He chooses to tell us about Himself, the compassionate, the merciful. Think about that, reflect. And number three, brothers and sisters, let us begin to listen to the message of the Quran. Let us begin to listen to our guide and implement the instructions of the guide. Follow what the guide is telling us. In a hadith in Sahih Muslim, the Prophet peace be upon him tells us, on the day of resurrection, the Quran and its people, the people of the Quran, the Quran and the people of the Quran, and the Prophet describes the people of the Quran. Who are these people? He did not say those who used to recite it, brothers and sisters. You know what he said? He said, those who acted according to it, these are Ahlul Quran, the people of the Quran. Those who act according to the Quran, so they follow their guide, they listen to the guide. On the day of resurrection, the Quran, and its people who acted according to it will be brought. And leading them will be the second and third chapters of the Quran, Surah Baqarah and Surah Al Imran. Leading them. In the Prophet, peace be upon him, the narrator tells us that he likened these two surahs, he gave three parables of these two surahs. He said he likened them to two clouds or two black canopies with light in between them, or like two flocks of birds, right? You see when geese migrate, they, form, they fly in formation, right? The V formation. Like two flocks of birds in ranks. And these souls will plead for the one who recited them and who acted upon them. In another hadith in Sahih Muslim, when Sa'd ibn Hisham Asked Aisha of the Allahu Anha, the beloved wife of the Prophet, peace be upon him. He said to her, Tell me about the character of the Messenger of Allah, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him. Tell me about his character, his behavior. She said to him, Don't you read the Quran? And he said, Yes, I read the Quran. And she said to him, فَإِنَّ خُلُقَ النَّبِيِّ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ كَانَ قرآن. She said that the character of the Messenger of Allah, of the Prophet of Allah, peace and blessings be upon him, was the Qur'an. His character, his behavior, his attitude, how he dealt with people. It was the Qur'an. It reflected the message of the Qur'an. So he did not just recite it to accumulate thawah, brothers and sisters. No. His character reflected and demonstrated this wonderful message. This message that changed and transformed society. That changed, as we say, the course of the history of the world. Brothers and sisters, the Prophet peace be upon him and the Sahaba, this is how he talked. They all had a personal connection and relationship with the Quran. Day after day after day, they would interact with the Qur'an. They did not bring it out in Ramadan, and then after Ramadan, they had no connection with the Qur'an, no. The Prophet ﷺ, when he used to do his prayers, his Salah, many of us ask, well, how can we concentrate in Salah? We find it difficult, right? Our thoughts stray all the time. Well, we're told in the authentic hadith that the Prophet ﷺ, when he was prayed, he performed his prayers, and he recited the Qur'an. When he recited verses that talked about Jannah, paradise, he did not just read and go on, he wanted to finish before 12 p.m. or 12 a.m., no. He would pause, and he would ask Allah for paradise. Oh Allah, admit me to paradise. And when he read verses that dealt with the hellfire, he would pause, and he would seek refuge with Allah from the fire. This is how he interacted with the Qur'an, brothers and sisters. This is what it means for the Qur'an to be a guide. 
I'm a one person deep, and I know I'm about to uh, finish. He had a, a nephew who was instrumental in spreading a rumor against his daughter Aisha radiallahu anha. And Quran would come down to claim her name and declare her innocence. And Abu Bakr Siddiq used to financially support this nephew of his. Oh, this is the thing. You can see from these two examples what the Quran meant to the Prophet peace be upon him and to the Sahaba. Let us begin to implement the, the message of the Quran little by little. Let the Quran become a guide. Let us listen to this guide, follow its instructions. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless all of us. May He open our hearts and minds so that not only can we understand this wonderful message, but that we would be motivated to live by the message. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cause us all to be from the people of the Quran, those who not only recite it properly in a way that's pleasing to Him, but that we also follow its, its injunctions. We make halal what the Quran makes halal, and we make haram what the Quran has made haram. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.